Hey. Welcome to Cranking Engine X211. My name is Helgi. I'm this fellow here. So I co-founded Orchestra.io, a PSP platform as a service. We got bought by Engineered, and we're sponsoring the social drinks tonight, I believe. Uh, I'm a pair developer. I'm from Iceland originally, but I live in Dublin. And I'm at H on Twitter. So if you want to haggle me during the talk or ask me questions, just tweet at me. No problem. Or if you want to tell me I'm you know, bad at this, whatever. <laughs> anyway, Nginx. So how many people here are actually using Nginx? Not everyone. All right. Just a fair warning. This is not a simple version of my talk. This is like the advanced version, so to speak. So I might actually do a simple version at the Uncomp. So if anyone is actually willing to you know, go to that as well. Anyway, Nginx. Is it just a web server? It really isn't, because it's a web server, it's a proxy, it's a reverse cache, it's a mail proxy, and a few other things. And I'll go through a few of those things um, through this talk, but one of the most important things I found when I was dealing with really complex websites and kind of with really complex Nginx setups was that dealing with the tweaking and how I actually made that happen without taking Nginx down. So those of you that use Linux for, uh, with Nginx will know config test, at least through Ubuntu. So config test is one of the most powerful tools you have with Nginx. So you don't have the silly little developer kind of accidentally doing a typo and taking down your whole website. So running config test after everything you do is really important. So it would be service Nginx config test and it would tell you, oh, you have a typo. But that's not really the interesting bit about the whole tweaking bit. Uh, when you reload your config, so you do service Nginx reload, it's really interesting to kind of figure out how that works and how that's going to affect the way you're dealing with your configuration and how you're just working with Nginx. So the reload is what they call in the Linux world the hub signal. And what happens is that when you're relo reloading the config, so Nginx has a master process and then it spawns off all the children, all the workers. So when you're reloading, you're actually spawning up new workers and attempting to put them into rotation. So Nginx slowly siphons off the old workers and basically lets them finish off the work they're doing, all the HTTP requests they have going on. It'll finish that and kind of slowly switch over to the new ones. So it's good to know kind of how the inner workings are doing it, because you'll have to debug this at some point. Uh, but you can actually also do upgrades. You can do live Nginx binary upgrades without taking your website down. So you can actually upgrade Nginx on the box, on the fly, without anything going down. So they use the user2 signal. There, there's a lot of kind of magic you have to do on the back end, but most distros will have that functionality for you already. But again, it's really, really interesting to see how this thing works. So you do a live upgrade, and essentially what you're doing is that you're bringing up a new master. Now you're not just dealing with new children or new workers, you're bringing up a whole new master. So you end up with two Nginx master processes working side by side, and it will try to actually give the control over to the new master with the new binary. If that fails, things should just fall back on using the old one. So it will attempt to give over control, and if that works, it will slowly start closing its own connections, and the new binary takes over all the connections. So these are kind of like really important bits to know when you're actually trying to work with Nginx. They seem a little bit weird at the start of the talk, but it's good to know what you're dealing with. Uh, so. One of the things that I have to deal with a lot is debugging, debugging HTTP requests or debugging just what the hell is happening on the web server. Since um, I help run, obviously, a platform as a service, then I have to deal with a lot of code that other people have written. But they kind of tend to blame the web server or the hosting company for their problems. So you have to be able to debug properly. So one of the things you can do, you have to compile with debug to get the debug kind of tokens and all that stuff into your logs, but one of the things you can do is set the log level to debug instead of critical or notice or so on.
but you may not want to do that all the time. You may not want to actually be able to do that for all the requests that are coming in because I only want to see it. I don't want to fill my logs with information from the millions of users that I have, or thousands maybe. So what you can do is that you can actually start using connection specific things. And by the way, if anyone has any questions or if I'm going too fast, just stop me. But like I said, this is an advanced talk. Um, so you can actually set debug connection and that automatically enables the debug logging only for specific IPs or subnets. So basically you can say all my developers, I want debug information when they are hitting my web server. But for everyone else, I don't care about it. Because I want to see what only that request is doing. Or if I just want my own IP to generate kind of those debug logs, you just put in your own IP there. Uh, so that kind of gives you a lot of information that you can figure a lot more low-level things out. But also, uh, when you're dealing with rewrite rules, so Nginx has rewrite rules built in, so you can easily do rewrite rules and all that kind of magic that Ap Apache you'd have to enable mod rewrite. Uh, but what you can do, uh, what the main problem with rewrite rules is that how do I debug it? Basically, for most developers, that is going to be, oh, I wrote a rule and it just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? <laughs> I don't know. You don't really get any information. So what you have to do is put the rewrite log on in Nginx and put notice level on. Because uh, all the rewrite log level information, all the problems and any kind of information related to it, it's going to be a notice level. We have to turn on the rewrite log for that to kind of pop up, otherwise Nginx is going to suppress it. Um, so it's really, really useful when you're actually trying to both move from Apache to Nginx and you're like, why is this not working? Because it used to work on Apache. And also if you're just developing generally new things. Um, so the rewrite module, like I said, it's, uh, it's just a regular expression, PCRE. But the, the biggest part about that is that the rewrite module is actually responsible for all if statements, file exist checks, returns, what have you. So you can do a return 404 and it's the rewrite module doing that magic. But also what you get through it is that most things in Nginx are going to be Nginx variables. Things that you can actually introspect on. Things that you can do rewrite rules based on these values. So you can have the user agent variable. You can have the HTTP cookie one, the URI. The URI is the unprocessed version, if I recall. And you can also set your own variables. It can either be setting a text directly. It can be based on a cookie information that you have processed in Lua. Uh, it can be whatever you want to. And so you can set a variable like that. And then later in the config, you can actually use that to do some checks. So you don't have to be doing the processing over and over again. So it gives you a lot of power with your config level stuff. Um, but a good kind of example of um, using Nginx variables and the rewrite module together. Here I'm just forwarding the domain for my blog. And I want to forward the www.helgi.ws to helgi.ws because obviously I want all the SEO and SME and you know, all that kind of magical buzzwordy things. So what I'm doing here is that I'm using the scheme Nginx variable, which would be HTTP or HTTPS, the request URI, which would just include all the get variables or what have you, anything that you pass in. And I'm returning a 301 HTTP code. So you, you can return any sort of HTTP code with return. So you can do 200, 301, 205, whatever you want. And you can include whatever you want behind here as well. Um, so it kind of shows the usefulness of these variables and the, the rewrite module, I guess. Um, so moving on from there a little bit onto the load balancing. Anyone using Nginx for load balancing? Two people, wow. All right, I'm going to educate everyone in here. All right, so here's a really, really simple 
round robin approach to load balancing in Nginx. Uh, you just define an upstream with whatever name you want, and you can define any server you want by their host name. It doesn't have to be anything more than that necessarily. Uh, so you just define it and it just sends people to it randomly. It's just a round robin, whatever is available. But not everyone wants that because some people believe they can do load balancing and then do HTTP sessions on the machines instead of using something like Memcast or Redis or so on. So for those people, we have to use something called IP hash. Uh, what that's going to do is that it's going to make sure that you always go to the same server for as long as possible. So if I hit www1, my next request is going to be www1 as well. But in the previous example, it would have just taken me to whichever one was there. Um, but at the same time, not all servers are made equal. Some of these servers might be more powerful than other ones. So for that, we define these servers. This is like a normal one. This one has a higher weight, and this one has a lower weight. So what we're doing here is telling Nginx, this one should get more traffic. This one specifically here should get more traffic. And after max two failures of a timeout of 15 seconds, we should stop sending traffic there for a while. And this one would be different as well. Uh, so originally, until the development version of Nginx, you couldn't use the weight and IP hashing together. So by default, in Nginx 1.2, this here would all be round robin kind of stuff. But now you can use the IP hash with it as well, so you're getting a lot of power from your load balancing in Nginx. While it may not be the most perfect load balancing solution out there, it gives you a damn good performance out of it. I use that, for example, in orchestra to load balance a bunch of things. All these examples that I'm showing here are used in orchestra in some shape or form. Um, any questions? Everyone glazed, hung over? Yes? No? Jesus. All right. What makes it fail? Huh? What makes it fail? What makes it fail? Uh, a non-200 response, usually, um, or just a timeout. It's a bit, you can configure it a little bit better. So failure can be whatever really you want to. You just need to configure that kind of a little bit more granular level. Um, but it's usually going for, oh, you're getting a timeout just in general, like a 504, essentially. Um, any other questions? No? All right. A soldier on. Uh, caches. So you can use Nginx as a reverse proxy as well. Um, well, these lights kind of kill this. All right, so here I am actually setting, this is something I use as well in production. <coughs> Scrubbed it out a little bit, but generally what I'm doing is that I'm setting the proxy, proxy headers, the real IP, so I'm taking the remote address that Nginx got from the user, the forward four headers, so I'm just passing that along as well. So all our PHP scripts still work properly when it's checking for like, what's your real IP? How can I authenticate who you are? And so on. I set the host as well, just so it doesn't fuck that up on the way. So it's not changing the host header somewhere along the way. But here's, here's the, the magic. Over here, I'm saying I want, so this levels means two directory deep. I'm setting the key zone called my cache two gigabytes maximum, and after 600 minutes, it becomes inactive. So we, we clean out things that are 600 minute old. And here we're just setting the temp path. But proxy cache use stale is kind of a magical thing. You'd see that in Varnish a lot. But what it does is it allows you to um, serve stale content while another process is, up, is updating the content that it's kind of in between. So it kind of, uh, it's a slam protection, essentially. It makes sure that as soon as you need new content, you don't get 10,000 connections back to your backend server asking for the same thing. So it's just going to be one thread going, hey, give me that. And at the same time, all the other 9,999 9, are going to serve up stale content. 
And down here, we're proxy passing example.net and using the defined cache up here. And we're saying the cache is uh, for 200 and 302 are valid for 60 minutes and 404 is one minute. So you can overwrite the default in active setting, essentially. So you say 404s have some sort of a caching, but I only want it for one minute. Or you could say 10 seconds. Or you can cache more than 200. You can cache 301 if you want as well. So there's a few things you can kind of mess around with. Any questions, comments? Why cache a 404 for only a minute? Uh, because potentially that 404 is going to be real content within the minute. So you, the assumption is, is that if you're unsure if an image is gone for like a legit reason or not, so you kind of want to keep the 404s to as small amount as you can because you don't want your you don't want the situation where you go, all right, we cache a 404 for an hour, and then a designer or a developer uploads like a PDF or whatever and no one can access it unless you actually restart Nginx. So it's that kind of stuff that you have to deal with. Um, but most, maybe for a lot of websites, a 404 is something you can cache for like 10 days. Depends on how you operate the website, really. But it kind of just shows that you can set different values for different header, or for different responses. Uh, any other questions? No? So dealing with headers is an interesting one in Nginx. Um, it has a really simple header kind of functionality. And here I'm just setting a simple cookie called underscore orchestra equals one. It, uh, it's only active for two seconds and it's on the top path for whatever I set it on. So in this case, orchestra.io. So this is a really simple example of how we add headers in Nginx. Well, that's about it. And I'm going to show you, though, a more powerful example of this in a bit. The other one is that it has something called expires that you can set to one hour. And just you can call it the future. And it will just put it as far in the future as you can. And it's for like images and stuff like that. But kind of the cool bits kind of come in with the modules. And to install modules, and we're going to in, like, look at how to do the, um, another header module, I guess. In this case, you actually have to have compiled your own Nginx to usually add in uh, modules. So you go into your source directory for Nginx and you go configure add module and then the location of the untarred module. And then you just make and make install. So in this case, it would be Nginx HTTP headers more module. And any kind of links I put in here, uh, you can just get them when I put the slides online as well. But in this specific module, you'd have to compile in. But it kind of gives you a lot more functionality. So Nginx by default only has add header and does expires stuff. This one allows you to, it's called more set headers. So my server is my temp, uh, temple. And over here, I can set more headers when you access bar, and I can set the content type uh, to plain and CSS and so on. And I can be setting specific returns for specific uh, HTTP responses. And in this case, I'm only setting the output header. And you can clear specific headers as well, and that's not something you can't do in Nginx by default. Clearing headers when you, as you go along and you want to use Nginx to kind of do the magical clearing without having to drop into PHP because you don't want that application to see it. So an example of that would be if you have, um, well, a load balancer or a proxy, and there's some header information you just want to drop because that's an authentication header that you don't want the PHP application to ever see. Then you can use something like clear headers and just say clear these two headers, the transfer encoding and the content type. I don't want that to get back to, the, to my application. But there's also specific things you can do. 
There's a difference between output and input headers, outputting like what you give the user. And that, that was this example, what you're giving the users. This is the input example, what comes in. And you're setting the host, so you, we're bluffing the host to London because we want the server to think their host is London. Or that's what they're getting, that's what people are requesting. And here we're setting the input header, this is what the user passed in, the user, which is what we overrode. But here, we're using more set input with dash, <coughs> dash R, and it will only overwrite it if it exists. So we're not actually injecting a header in there unless it, it, it exists and we actually want to change it. So it kind of, these kind of header, like these kind of modules give you a lot of power. And I'm going to talk about a few more now. And a little bit of kind of blue sky thinking. Has anyone actually used any modules with Nginx? Those of you that actually use Nginx. One, two. Everyone in the back. Cool kids in the back. All right, so a bit of blue sky thinking. Um, who here uses Memcache with their application? A good few. And uh, anyone uses Redis? Good few as well. All right. So usually, you're obviously using that to kind of gain speed and so on. And this is the usual request flow that you have if you're dealing with Memcache. You get a request coming into Nginx, it drops into PHP, and the PHP is going to talk to Memcache. And from there, it's obviously then going to go back with the content with, from whatever is going on there. But what we can do is something a little bit different. Now imagine if you had an API that you wanted to perform really well. What if your API didn't have to talk to PHP most of the time? What if Memcache contained most of the data that you needed and Nginx could just talk directly to Memcache for you? As long as it understood the structure of your API and knew that, oh, I have a request here, thus I'm going to request this memcache key. That's going to cut PHP out of the equation and things are going to speed up dramatically. So in this scenario, what you can do, Nginx is talking to memcache and they're talking together all the time. They're best buddies. But when memcache doesn't actually have the value, Nginx will actually start talking to PHP and we're expecting PHP to insert the new value into memcache. So for the next request, Nginx can talk, talk to memcache directly. This is the kind of scenario that you think about, oh, I, I'm always trying to speed up my application and this is like the perfect way. Cut out the actual slow bit, PHP. Um, so here's kind of a traditional Nginx talking to memcache. Um, in this scenario, with the default memcache module, there are a few other ones that are a little bit better, but this is the default one that you actually get with Nginx without having to bother with it. Uh, what you have to do is, if the, if the request is not a get method, essentially, we will fall back to the fast CGI stuff at the bottom. So essentially, I, if there's a post request, I want to talk to PHP. But from here on, we need to deal with all the MIME types. So in, if Memcache was actually containing XML or JSON or other things like that, we're going to have to go, oh, OK, arcs, which is just the argument variable for Nginx, it will contain all the arcs that you, have, that you pass in in your, um, in your URL. And we check, oh, is the format equal JSON? OK, so we'll do a rewrite rule that will change the URI and add, append a dot JSON behind it. And then we'll break and we'll stop processing more of these things. We, we won't do more um, rewrite rules. We'll check the same for XML and HTML. And if it passes, it passes through all of these, the only thing we're doing here is fixing up the rewrite rules or setting a default type with uh, the proper content type and the character set. And that's about it. So the magic sauce is down here, which on this slide I kind of broke out. So here, as I said earlier on, using the set magic is kind of useful because in this case, we're doing set memcache key and we're saying the URI, actual, actual, the actual URL, and all the arguments that come after it, so slash Helgi, question mark, you know, 
hungover maybe, then all of that would be saved here. And, and this module specifically needs you to set that key, but this allows you to set it only to URI if you only want the URIs to be used as the key. You can, do, uh, you can set nginx dash in front of it if you want specifically only nginx to talk, up, talk to nginx keys as such. So you'd have to just make PHP save things as nginx dash whatever. So it, it gives you that kind of power. And here, the memcache pass is only just passing it because our memcache is on a local host, but it could be whatever you want. And then we're saying, for any kind of errors, 500, 404s, 405, that memcache is kind of coming across, it will do the fallback, and the fallback would be the fast CGI stuff, right? So this is an example of that, but there are other memcache modules that can do a lot of these things uh, themselves, and you can find them on the wiki.nginx.org uh, in the add-on section. They can do things like deal with post, put. Um, you can actually use them to do memcast inserts from Nginx itself. So you could do a lot of the processing in Nginx and then insert into Nginx itself, kind of cutting PHP again out of the equation. But why would you necessarily do that? You can basically build your application in Nginx, is essentially it. And I'm gonna show you now kind of how we can do that a little bit. Not a heck of a lot of code, but I will show you how to talk to my SQL from Nginx. Uh, but before that, there's this really cool module called set misc module, which you actually need to use with the MySQL stuff. What it does is it, it's basically augmenting the rewrite module. Uh, so in this case, here's a handy one. I pass in slash beer and the amount equals 12. And in this case, I pass in nothing. So you can actually do, uh, it provides something called set if empty. So it's saying if yes, in this case, yes is, oh wait, this is supposed to be amount. I seem to have fucked this up, shit. Uh, so in this case, I'm setting amount to arg underscore yes, or amount. And in that case, then I go, is this empty? So in this case, the top one, you would get 12. But if it's empty, we would set it to 9,999. Uh, so it allows you to do kind of really simple, if set, do this, if not, then do the default value. And the other cool thing, actually, in this slide is that you, instead of using the args, variable, you can do arc underscore and whatever the name here is. So you can access individual arguments just by referencing stuff like this. So we can do arc underscore Helgi, arc underscore UK, you know, whatever you pass in there, you can read it through this variable. So it gives you a lot of power. Um, so in this case, uh, this is really important for if you're doing anything kind of MySQL or you want to basically make sure no one is fucking with your data before you pass it into anything. <laughs> so it, it's called set unscape URI because by default, Nginx will have processed all the arc variables, right? And so it will have escaped bunch of things that you may not want to save, like push slashes and stuff like that. But that doesn't make it necessarily safe to insert into a database, right? So what we need to do is we need to first unescape the thing, as weird as that sound, and then we need to use set quote SQL string. And what that means is that it's doing the usual, you know, MySQL real escape and all that kind of what PHP developers are used to. So in this case, uh, set unscape URI is unescaping yes into name, and in this case, we're actually quoting name into quoted name. It seems a little bit backwards because the variable that you end up with is the one in the front, and we're actually working on the one in the back. Uh, but in both these cases, you can actually skip the, the, uh, the back one, and it will do in variable kind of replacement. It will just reuse the same one and just modify that one. So this 
you do this way if you want to get a whole new variable without messing around with the old one. But if you drop this, and this would be name, then it will just change the name variable for you, and you can keep on going. So it provides a bunch of other ones as well. Um, and this is kind of starts getting interesting because it has something called set MT5, set SHA1, so it actually generates a hash for you in Nginx. It can encode and decode base64 stuff. HMAC, SHA1, set random, and a secure random alphanum and a few other ones along the same lines. You can actually you can use these things to do secure downloads, for example. You can use it to actually do the authentication of users, an API authentication, an HMAC authentication, essentially. You can do it all in Nginx without actually touching your application. And that's pretty spiffy, in my opinion. But you can't really do that without pulling the data from somewhere. You could pull it from Memcache. But we can also just pull it from MySQL. And so far, any questions? People are just sitting at the edge of their seat. This is what's going to happen. All right, so MySQL. So it's called the Drizzle Nginx module. So for those that don't know, Drizzle was a fork, essentially, or a rewrite of MySQL that is kind of open sourced as well, pretty good. But the guy that wrote this, he made it compatible with all of them because they're API compatible. So you can go to this location to get the module and, and compile it. But so when you're dealing with Nginx, you always have to create upstreams for everything. So for PHP, you have to reference the PHP FPM and Unix socket, for example. In this one, you do this, you do drizzle server, and you need to do drizzle server. If you do server, the whole thing will just go kabloomy. But, excuse me, what you need to do is drizzle server, the host name, the port, and then here you can define things like database name, the character set, the user, and so on. So you do one of these first, and then we can do this. This is the magic. In the location slash secret, we get passed in a name, <coughs> and we access it by using the arg underscore name. We unescape it first to kind of unmess what Nginx did for us. Then we quote it into quoted name, and basically do drizzle query, and then insert into agents quoted name. So now everyone has access to our secret agent, agents, essentially. And you need to do drizzle pass and tell it use my SQL backend, which is this name here. So whatever name you define here, you have to define as drizzle pass and that name. So it just knows who it's talking to. Also in here, it's worth to note that you can actually add multiple MySQL servers. It can deal with a lot of really handy um, replication stuff. And No, actually not replication, sorry. Um, it basically, you can load balance through this. You can just define multiple ones of them, and it will figure out which one to talk to for you. So that's kind of handy, so you can have fallbacks and so on. So we insert something into agents, our new fancy table. But the thing is, right now, Nginx is not really good at exposing post as a variable. You can kind of get it through sometimes through the arc underscore stuff, but you're better off just getting this module, HTTP form input module, and it allows you to mess around with all that data. Um, yeah, so this one is really handy for any kind of multi-form multi, um, things essentially. But in this one, we're basically just doing the same thing again, except we're selecting from the agent. So this is a different kind of, you can both insert, you can update, uh, you can select, and you can use all of these and do stuff with the resulting uh, data. But the thing is, um, it's not JSON by default, and that kind of messes up a lot of things. So it has this thing called RDS, which is a binary format uh, that, um, that you can't really do anything with. You know, Nginx is not going to output that for you. So in theory, if you're just wanting to insert stuff and kind of internally read it, that's cool, but what you're going to do with it is, you know, you can't do much. 
But there's this thing that you can do. There's a JSON plus uh, CSV output module that you can plug on top of the RDS binary format. And it's located in these two locations. So the RDS JSON Nginx module, the RDS CSV Nginx module, it's the same thing. You need to compile it in, all that kind of stuff. But using the MySQL stuff without having this is kind of redundant. So in this case, having installed that, now we can add RDS underscore JSON on or CSV on, and there you can configure a few bits and bobs, like what's the terminator, what's the quotes around the CSV, and so on. But when you have this here, it will automatically start returning JSON strings for you. So for any inserts, you'll get how many rows were affected, also for updates, you get the insert ID through the JSON with, if you add this like small thingy here, all the values come back as JSON. So what you can do at this point is imagine if we took the memcache example from before and we go, okay, I can't find anything in memcache. I will go and talk to my MySQL counterpart in Nginx. You get the data from there and that's in a JSON format. You save that into memcache and now suddenly you almost have like a full on application happening in Nginx. Um, and that's kind of interesting. You know, you can write fairly performing APIs through that. Um, you can also do Lua scripting in there. So it's one of these interesting scenarios where you start thinking, do I really want to be doing PHP or do I want to be doing Nginx? And Lua, I guess. Um, so there's a lot of power. Like I didn't touch on all the cool bits in there, but I'm t I touched on enough kind of hopefully get people thinking and start looking into Nginx and the modules and kind of dealing, even though you have to deal with compiling a few things in there, the power you get from it is so immense that it'd be silly not to really. There's so many small bits in there that you can use that, yeah, I just like it. I just love it. Uh, doing all these things. I mean, you can, so all these examples with the Memcache stuff, there's a Redis equivalent, so you don't have to be stuck with memcache necessarily. Uh, there's a really cool add-on there that does GridFS, which essentially means it does Mongo. The same guy, all this um, MySQL stuff, it can do Postgres as well. It's just a different module that works exactly the same way. Um, so there's a lot of interesting power in there that you can kind of siphon from Nginx and the kind of community that's been building around it.